or an administrator or maybe a student presentation. And I just want to get more experience with, you know, seeing, you know, playing around with it. I'm actually using my phone to, as a poor man's lapel mic. So that tells you a little bit about the budget that I'm dealing with at the school <laughs> where, uh, where I work. Um, my name is Eric Hansen. I work at East Pennsboro Middle School, just down the road, middle school and high school. I'm the media specialist and tech coach. And this is actually the first year for that position. My previous 12 years with the district have been in the high school social studies department. And um, the first thing I want to do before we jump into this is I just scribbled down uh, some things that I took from Ned Sheeran's, was that his name, Ned Sheeran? Um, from his uh, keynote that I thought applied to what we're going to be talking about a little bit here today with video production. Um, the first one, what do kids want to learn? What do they want to do? Or what are they already learning and doing independently from school? What is it that they're already out there hungry to learn? And I don't know. I mean, I think of my own kids. My daughter is seven. My middle daughter is five. And I don't know if you've ever seen this before. It's, it's kind of odd. But when they get something new, it could be anything from a, a Christmas present to a banana. When they open it, they pretend like they're in a YouTube video. So they'll be like, hi, my name's Lauren. And then the little one, and I'm Kate. And we're here to open this banana and see what's inside. And it's just a habit that they've fallen into. So... So, I mean, I don't know, maybe, sorry, maybe it's, of course, there we go, <clears throat> maybe it's just the house that they're growing up in, I don't know if you've ever seen anything like that before, but I don't know. So they watch these videos of kids who are reviewing toys, unpacking. you guys seen that before? Yeah, unpacking, yeah. unboxing videos, unboxing. yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, so. That's something that my, I know my own children are definitely consuming video as much as they possibly can get. They can't get enough of it. Uh, next, don't just consume, create. That was something that he said this morning. Um, I think obviously we can do that in schools. Uh, our kids are consuming video. There's no doubt about that. Um, but how about we flip that around and have them thinking about what it takes to create it. In a lot of cases, they're creating it too. I mean, I don't know if I want to look at a 13 or 14 year old's Snapchat or Instagram account, right? I'm not, I, I just don't know if I have the courage for that. But the, uh, the fact that they're creating content and putting it on the cloud and putting it online, they're doing that whether they really realize they're doing it or not. Are we teaching them these skills? Are we doing anything to help them do that better or with a purpose um, or maybe for a different purpose? Something to think about. Scrounge. Right? Just whatever you can possibly get to make the job a little bit better. Um, I'm going to be presenting some options <clears throat> to start a video production lab or maybe improve a video production lab, not just for your library or makerspace or whatever, but even for individual classrooms, I think this applies. I'm going to give you a number of different kind of budget levels. I want, I want you to be clear. Again, this is my first couple months at the job. I don't know if you've heard, but we at East Penn have had a bit of a rocky start at the, to the year, right? And so I'm inventing, like every day I'm just trying to keep my head above water. I don't want to come across like I'm some expert on, I have this awesome video lab over there and I'm gonna show you how to do it. That's not what this is, okay? This is a, uh, a fellow educator with a really tight budget trying to figure it out. And I just wanna share my thought process I'm no more an expert on this stuff than you guys are, okay? I've done some reading, I've done something, but I just want you to, to know what you're, what you're in for here. We're, we're kind of equals, okay, in this discussion. Um, get started, right? Don't wait until you get the side, that temptation. It's like, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna get this funding and then I'm gonna buy this sweet camera and I'm gonna get this awesome MacBook Pro and we're gonna just start flying with this thing. And oh, uh, would, wouldn't you know there was a hiccup in the process and it's not quite happening the way I thought it was. So what do we do? Do we sit on our hands or do we just go for it, right? And I'm gonna try to show you some examples of what it looks like when you just dive in, okay? 
Uh, and then I'll show you some examples of what it can look like if you actually can get something respectable up and running as well. Um, makerspace storage probs. He showed uh, a picture of all of these you know, bins and containers. And uh, I'm going to make a pitch for your video lab being as mobile as it can possibly be. On some site visits that I've been to, I've seen production studios that were about the size of a coat closet. I mean, it was just a green screen with a camera, enough room for you to get the decent you know, amount of uh, focal length that you need. And that was it. All the production and stuff was happening in a more comfortable space. So we don't necessarily need a ton of space. And I do think there's an advantage to being as mobile as we can be for something like this. So um, basically two parts to this. Why we should be teaching video production. It's a little more on the philosophical end, why this is important. And then how to actually do it more on the practical side. Okay, just some ideas on how we can get started with it really today. All right. So teaching video production, why bother? The more I've been thinking about this question, the more I've seen video production aligning with writing, the writing process. Um, I was actually just talking to a group of eighth graders yesterday. They're getting ready tomorrow. We're going on a field trip to study the pollution levels in the Conda Gwinnett Creek. And um, we we're talking about pre-production, the plan before you start filming. And they're filming with the purpose of actually gathering evidence. So it's very much a different purpose than maybe uh, some other applications might, might have them do. So we're thinking about what kind of footage do you want to have? What's, you know, what's your goal? What's the end product in mind? And a lot of what that was, was kind of the outlining process for an essay, for example. And if your students are anything like my students have been, the outline on an essay is like, Maybe I'll write it after I'm done with my essay because it's a requirement. It's like, it's just a pain in the butt. I just don't want to have to do it. But no student that's ever sat down and actually thought through and, and have gone through the outline process um, ever wrote a poor essay because they went through that process. It's a good process. They could click with this idea that, oh, yeah, I definitely need a plan before I go to the field trip to film this footage. That made sense to them. And then I could kind of come back around and say, hey, this is what we should be doing with all of our academic work. So it's almost like there was a back door. And I think there's a lot of that with the concept of, of filming video. When kids realize that their face is going to be online for potentially anybody to see, the stakes are raised a little bit more. When they sit down to write an essay, they're thinking, this is, what, what's the point of it? It's for a grade. It's so I don't fail. So I just get over the edge that I want, maybe, for some of our kids, right? With the state, there's nothing really personal. There's not a personal, emotional attachment to the work that they're doing. I think we get some more of that with video production. Um, I also think that you can take an essay, you could take a written assessment and say, hey, by the way, at the end, you're going to make a two-minute video that sums up the ideas in your essay. And again, I think that almost tricks them into wanting to make that essay better because, again, they know there's a little bit more to this. My name's going to be, my face is going to be attached to this a little bit more than it might have been otherwise. Again, other things, kind of surprising things that you might not have thought about when it comes to video production. Um, but getting down kind of to the nitty gritty of it, some outline points here. Um, just generally, we're going to talk about how it connects to the curriculum. I'm going to throw up some things that I pulled from the curriculum, uh, and, and you you tell me if you think that you could find a connection between video production and these points on the curriculum. The four C's of 21st century learning, and then we'll just kind of dabble in all the different applications. And we're going to move pretty quickly through this, but connections to the curriculum, the research process. Is there anything within the research process that could connect to video production? I just mentioned that tomorrow, a bunch of eighth graders are going to be down by the creek filming for, to gather evidence. Okay. Um, evaluating, analyzing, and integrating information. I was speaking with one of you this morning um, who was talking about an assignment in which students were creating commercials. And instead of jumping in, how many of you have seen, I mean, I know you know this, you, you assign a kid a presentation, like a PowerPoint presentation, and then you have to sit through it. <laughs> You're like, why am I doing this? Why am I putting myself through this? I don't have to do this. Uh, and the same is so often true with video. 
you hit play. And I don't know, for me, so, so often my kids, it's, they don't take it seriously. They're giggling through it. Uh, it's not polished at all. They take no attention to the video quality, if it's backlit, if it's grainy, if you can even hear what they're saying in the audio. Uh, it's just they got it done and they turned it in, right? Um, <clears throat> what if, before they made a commercial, for example, as an assignment, what if they had to fill out uh, a, a written assignment in which they analyzed a real commercial? They counted how many shots there were. They analyzed, is this a close-up shot? Is it a wide shot? Um, is the person looking into the camera? Or are there two people talking? Just observing it. And then say, okay, that's the outline. Now you do that and just mimic it. How much better would that be, right? So it's just that thought process and evaluating, analyzing. Uh, what else? Preparing multimedia presentations. Duh. It's pretty straightforward. Producing and publishing with technology. I think, I don't know, I think when they were writing the curriculum, they were thinking more written word, but why not? Why not adding to the loads of junky video that's on YouTube and adding some quality stuff on there? There's quality stuff up there. Let's have our kids be contributors. Get them in the game. Right? How cool would it be if an instructional video that our kids made started to blow up because some other teacher was sending it to their kids? Right? That kind of thing. Using information ethically and responsibly. You know, can I pick my favorite song and interject it in my video? Am I allowed to do that? Is that breaking the law? Is that copyright? Is that plagiarism? We teach our kids plagiarism with writing, with copy and pasting from Wikipedia. We know that's a no-no. But what about when we're doing this, right? Behaving as digital citizens, kind of in the same line. <clears throat> Evaluating diverse media. Uh, do I need video to tell this particular story? Uh, could I tell it with just audio? Do I want to use still pictures? Do I want text on the screen? Lots of different applications there. All right, so the four C's, they are, to refresh your memory, creativity collaboration, critical thinking, and communication. And just going over what we've gone over so far, I think it's pretty evident that we're hitting all of them with creating videos. Video production unleashes student creativity, especially when they're given the proper tools. Um, some of these kids are so ready that if we give them some devices, so if we're in, maybe not so much for a classroom budget, but if we're in a, a library space, maybe we can scrape together enough dollars to get them a special kind of camera, something that they don't carry around in their pocket in the form of a cell phone or that's attached to their Chromebook or something that's actually made to shoot quality video. Maybe if we could just get one of those, it might inspire kids to wanna to do something great with that. Or maybe if we can give them real professional video editing software like Final Cut Pro, maybe they'll start to really dig into that and start to learn things that, who knows, might be their career someday, right? Uh, Adding these resources to a makerspace or to a library, again, you're just kind of opening up possibilities for kids. Uh, collaboration, teams of students filling different roles, working together throughout the pre-production, filming, and post-production processes. Um, I'm thinking of the kid who, you know that kid wants to be in front of the camera, right? And doing his thing, doing her thing, you know, getting that attention they so crave. And that other kid having just as much an important role on that project who does not want to be in front of the camera, but who is very comfortable behind it, right? And having them work together and um, really, you know, use their talents towards a common project. Critical thinking, video production is super complicated. Um, and so complex problems in video production requiring students to make decisions, considering the consequences, find alternate solutions. Just an example, uh, I was talking to this again with my eighth graders yesterday. When they're filming their footage for this science project, do they want to have a student narrating it as they walk around the creek, as they look at things? Or would it make more sense to just get raw footage of what they're doing and then audio narrate after the fact? Might that be better than the ums and the stammering and the giggling that's going on and the wind that blows across the mic and you can't hear anything? Now, once they realize, oh, maybe I will put the audio in after, it changes their plan before they even start shooting film. 
that's a lot of complicated critical thinking going on. I mean, you're thinking of the end product before you even get moving. And then communication. Not only are these teams of kids, it's necessary for them to communicate with each other so they're on the same page and yeah, argue and figure it out and have to work with people that they might not easily work with. But the videos themselves are a great means by which to communicate digitally and globally. Um, I'm a big fan of 30 to 90 second videos. Just enough to kind of hook people and then point them if they want more information. How much more effective is that than send, even sending an email in terms of getting a response from someone? Okay. So again, to teach these skills and all their different applications, speaking of applications, um, <clears throat> we already saw some of them. Connect students with learners worldwide through the sharing of video. Um, again, you could even have kids um, from around the world work on a video project together, right? I mean, the cloud makes that possible. Um, <clears throat> students and teachers creating video lessons for flipped classroom applications. We talk about teachers creating these videos, but why not have kids work with the teachers to do it? Or just have the students themselves make them. Um, actually had a, uh, a sewing lesson, like how to thread a sewing machine. And kids actually going through the process, that video will then be used next year as an instructional video for the next group of kids to take that class. Again, just more, adding more resources. Um, this is an interesting one that I'm still learning more and more about. The concept of a video essay. It's an essay like any other essay is, but the creativity, just the, the, all the different options you have from selecting music to how you're shooting it to how you're using text, how you're using photos within the concept of you want to you convey an idea, maybe you want to teach something. This idea of a video essay is something that I'm personally really into. Um, <clears throat> as we talked about with the Creek Pollution uh, Project, documenting video evidence, highlighting and sharing student and teacher achievement, you know, build up morale. How cool would it, uh, would it be for a kid to see a really professionally done video that highlights that kid, right? And they know that it's up there for anybody to see. And how might that inspire other kids when they think, oh, I want you to make a video about my thing, the thing that I'm doing. We can set these processes up in our libraries to where it's kind of a well-oiled machine. We have our shots planned. We have the amount of time it's going to take. We have the audio and all the cameras all set up. So this might take 20 minutes of a kid's time to come down. We get the shots we want and we tell that story. It might be a 60 second video, but the ripple effects that that can have throughout your school. Um, and we can never cast our kids in a, in a bright enough light. I just feel like that positive energy is, is awesome. And artistic expression um, as well, of course. I want to show you just a couple examples in addition to this stuff. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Here's something I did last year with, this is a video that I put together and all it is is text. And you could do this with Wii Video. You could do this on a Chromebook with a website for free um, without even any video footage. And I pulled music. Um, it's old Gregorian chant. It's the Renaissance. Um, you know, complete uh, free creative use. And well, I'll just kind of show just a minute or two of this. Now, the point of this wasn't necessarily to inform any of you about aspects of the Renaissance. That really wasn't what my motivation was. But I had my students, I gave them some tough questions straight from the AP, you know, course book. <clears throat> this was one of them. And I had them write their answers to these. And then I cherry picked the very best things that they contributed in their longer answers. And slapped their name on it. 
and showed it in class. And they're looking, oh, who wrote that one? Oh, that was me. Man, that smell sounded smart. I can't believe I wrote that. <laughs> and, I did, and I did this on like the first week of school. And it just set a positive tone for, eh, maybe I don't hate history. And maybe I'm okay at history, right? Because I'm picking like, the, I'm trying to make them sound as best as they possibly can. All right. So again, there's something magic, I think, about video and the fact that this is shareable. Um, and this is done on zero budget. This is done without actual video footage, OK? Now, this is the other end of the spectrum. I pulled this from Milton Hershey's website. and They're dealing with a little bit more resources than I am. But this is what's possible if we choose to focus on this. I've been here for two years, and I went to an open house, and there was a list of all the activities on the screen, and a lot of them were music related, and I love to sing, so I said, I want to come to that school. Listen to the song here in my heart. A melody I start but can't Think about complete. the shots that they're using. Think about how my much setup this would have taken to do. And some songs just like really grab me at the heart and I can just express my emotions through throughout the performance on stage. It's hard to get people to listen to you when you're like 16 years old and you go to high school with all these other students and they're all telling their stories and it's hard to fit in but like when I'm on stage it's like I'm the only person on stage and all eyes are on me and everyone has to focus on what I'm saying and if I make it like enjoyable enough and entertaining enough then they, they I can get my point across and they can understand where I'm coming from. If it weren't for Milton Hershey, okay, I don't so think that I would Again, have... that's a beautiful story, but even more so, I counted really two shots. They might have stock footage of their campus. That's kind of what you're seeing here. But there was a shot of her, just a talking head shot of her in an interview, and they had her sing a little bit. And then they showed up at one of her music classes and got some, some B-roll to interject over top of her, uh, her interview response. <laughs> The whole video is a minute and 28 seconds, and it's probably one of the coolest things that this kid's gonna take away from school, right? And her other, her peers are gonna know her in a way that they might never have before. Now, I don't know what that, what the ripple effects of that look like in a school, but I can't wait to find out, because this is, I was like, I, we can do this. There's, no, there's nothing stopping us from doing this at East Penn. So we're gonna do it, and we're gonna see what happens. That's cool, right? Yeah, it is. All right. Uh, let's see, where are we? <clears throat> A few minutes left. Let's show you how much this stuff costs. <laughs> the, um, the short answer is it can cost whatever, uh, whatever you've got. So how do you do this? <clears throat> Here are four steps that I think kind of simplify. And I give them these names kind of like, the trims on the new car you're gonna buy. Uh, the first one is built with what you already have. Uh, the enhanced option is gonna still use that base, but then you know I'll show you what to put your money toward first, and you can drop between a thousand and five thousand bucks on that. And then this is the option I'm shooting for at East Penn. I call it the professional option. I think it gives you that polished look like you saw in that Milton Hershey video, uh, and that's looking five to ten grand. And then there's premium, which is it's just there for, for laughs, because come on, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's what you have laying around in your school. You have these Canon ZR600s that you open them up and they have the DV tapes. They're there somewhere. They might be in the basement, they might be in a storage closet somewhere. There's probably like five or six boxes of them. I know that you have them because I have them at East Penn and, or flip cams or something like that. But better than all of those are the smartphones and the cameras that your kids are already carrying around. The computers that you already have, the tablets, if you have Chromebooks, you can still use those. You can use Windows Movie Maker, as much as I would not suggest that. Uh, iMovie, if you're so lucky to have Macs. And Wii Video, I showed you the video that I, that I shot there. Uh, a, 10 bucks can get you a tripod that'll keep your camera steady. You can borrow a green screen. This is what we're doing right now. This is pretty much where we're at. All right, I wanna move kind of quickly through this. You can add a quality camcorder. That's what's sitting right over there, between five and 800 bucks. Okay, and the benefit of a camcorder is you can zoom. 
Okay, but you're probably not going to really want to zoom all that much unless you're filming sports, which is or or like theater production, which you you might be doing a lot of that. It's not really what my focus is going to be for what I want to do at East Penn, but um, but it's what we've got and it's what we're rolling with. You can upgrade your older computers. SSD hard drives will make the editing process faster, and the more RAM you have, the better your life will be. The software, the two biggies are Adobe. You might already have a subscription to Adobe that has Photoshop, but what you really want is Premiere for editing video. Uh, we're gonna go the route of Final Cut Pro, and the reason is it costs $300, but it's a one and done purchase. So if you bought that 10 years ago, you still get every update that Apple comes out with, and it's really good software. Uh, the accessories you'd wanna add are maybe some extra batteries and some faster, higher capacity SD cards for recording video. Then, if you add that up, you get between one and two. If you really wanna get, and this is kinda of where we're at now, you wanna go buy as new of a MacBook Pro as you can. It'll handle the processing, it'll run Final Cut Pro, Get Apple Care with it so you don't have to stress too much about it and be prepared to spend up to three grand on just that computer. But it'll last you. It'll last you five or six years. It's pretty good for a computer that's going to edit video. Sorry to jump in here. Uh, you said a Wii video? WeVideo.com. That, that's a web-based? All online. So you can do that on like a Chromebook or something? Yes, you can. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sorry, I know I'm going fast, but I want to get it get you guys out of here. Yeah, that bumps it up to that four to $5,000 range. Okay, so depending on where you are, this is what I'm trying to convince everybody, anybody that'll listen, what we need at East Penn in order to kind of take that next step. I'm right now borrowing a MacBook Pro from 2012 that has as much RAM in it as my Chromebook does from our IT guy who doesn't know that I have it right now. So it's kind of a battle, right? But you got to scrounge, right? It's the rule of the day. So I figure once it gets violent enough, the district will be like, all right, let's just get the guy the thing that he wants so he can calm down. Um, <clears throat> this is what I hope to see uh, eventually. A Panasonic GH4 with the 12 to 35 millimeter. Uh, that lens alone is about 800 bucks, just the lens. The camera is 1,200 bucks. You're gonna get the nice blurry background that you saw in the video, right? It's the only way you can do it. You need a nice high quality camera to get that professional shot. There's no way around it, okay? That's why it's so expensive. Um, get the MacBook, get Final Cut Pro, get a nice microphone, get a couple SD cards, get that external. This is my shopping list. This is my wish list. And you can get that for about six grand. So that's that's right now where I'm at, and that's pretty much starting from scratch. If you don't have anything worth using right now, and you get those things, you'll be able to make that Milton Hershey video, okay? And then just for giggles, get as many DSLR cameras as you can with all kinds of different lenses, uh, a whole lab of MacBook Pros. The software is gonna be the same, but you could get motion, which will help you do more animation and stuff like that. And then all kinds of different mics and professional lighting and stabilization rigs, and you can go on and on and on and on. Um, it's unbelievable the amount of money that you can spend in video production. But you can really set yourself apart for that $6,000 price point, depending on where you wanna go with it. Now, my last thing I'm gonna say is, jump in with what you have now and decide for yourself where that bottleneck is. What is it that you need in your specific situation? What is it that your kids are clamoring for? What is it that your teachers wanna be able to do? My strategy is to make some cool videos, get them out, get teachers inspired, and have them come to me and say, why can't I make a video like that? And they'll say, come to me, let's do this, right? And we'll make it happen. It's warm in here. I think we're out of time. Any questions? I would love to connect with you. Yeah, that's don't ask. Um, <clears throat> my email is ehanson at epasd.org. And like I said at the beginning, uh, you know, I'm figuring this out day by day as we go. And I'd, you know, the more minds we can get together on this, the better. Thanks for checking it out. Thank you.